Hi, welcome to the History of Ancient Greece podcast. I am not Ryan Stitt. My name is Dominic Perry, and I run another podcast that is loosely related to the one Ryan is currently producing. The History of Egypt podcast tells the story of the Nile Valley civilization from the year 5000 BCE all the way up to 0 AD. I've been a big fan of Ryan's podcast since day one, and I'm sure you'll agree that he came roaring out of the gate with an excellent product that is both scholarly, insightful, and accessible. I'm excited to see which directions he takes his story in, as the history of ancient Greece is, in so many ways, the history of the Mediterranean world. The Greeks are a focal point around which so many cultures turned. Naturally, there's a lot of shared interest between Ryan and myself, and we have a lot of overlaps in terms of cultural and political interests. What this is going to mean is that very soon the Egyptian History Podcast and the History of Ancient Greece will unite for some joint episodes where we tell the story of interactions between Greeks and Egyptians at certain points in history. We've only just started working on these episodes, but I can tell you they're going to be fantastic. So for now, sit back and enjoy the History of Ancient Greece with Ryan Stitt, your weekly dose of the story and culture of the Hellenic civilization. Enjoy! Hello, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 15, Colonization in the East. After the Greeks were well underway in the West, they also turned their attention to the North and the Northeast. Colonies were also established on the coasts of Macedon and Thrace, beginning around 700 BC. The northwestern corner of the Aegean Sea became the special domain of Euboea. There is a huge three-pronged promontory in Thrace that juts out into the Aegean Sea. Here, Halkis colonized so many towns that the whole promontory was called the Halkidiki Peninsula. The three prongs are called, from left to right, Pelene, Synthonia, and Octae. Patadia, one of the chief cities, however, was founded by Corinth, at the narrowest point of the Pelene Peninsula. Some colonies on Pelene were founded by Eretria and those north of Octae by Andros, which was at that time a dependent of Eretria. On the west side of the Thermaic Bay, two Euboean colonies were planted, Pydna and Methone, on Macedonian soil. In the mid-7th century BC, Clazomenae, a city-state from Ionia, founded Abdera on the Thracian coast almost directly opposite the island of Thassos in the northern Aegean Sea and east of the Halkidiki Peninsula. Abdera flourished because of its highly strategic position. Its territory controlled the road passage between Thrace and Macedonia, and it sat in the middle of the sea route between the Troad, the Thracian coast, and the Macedonian coast. Abdera also would become one of the richest Greek cities, thanks to its trade with the interior of Thrace. With the northern Aegean in their midst, over the next century, the Greeks turned their attention to the northeast, establishing colonies in the Dardanelles, which is the Hellespont, the Sea of Marmara, also called the Propontis, the Bosporus Strait, and the Black Sea, also known as Euxine or Pontus. Dates are even more extremely difficult to pinpoint for this region, so we will just describe the most important colonies, though not all-encompassing in a rough chronological order. Also, following the Lelantine War, as was discussed last episode, the Eubians receded as the dominant colonizing force and were eclipsed by the Phocaeans in the west and Miletus in the east, who had grown to become one of the leading Ionian cities. The voyage of the Argonauts in quest of the Golden Fleece commemorates in legend the memorable day in which Greek sailors first burst forth into the waters of the Black Sea. Accustomed to the island straits and the short distances of the Aegean, they fancied that when they had passed the Bosporus, they were embarking on a boundless ocean, and thus they called it the Pontus, which is Greek for sea. Even when they had circumnavigated its shores, it might have still seemed boundless, for they did not know where the great rivers might lead. Those are the Ister, which is the modern Danube in Romania the Dnapris, or modern Dnepir in Ukraine, and Tanais, 
or modern Don in Russia. The Pontus was a treacherous field for the ships of even experienced sailors, and it was supposed to have received, for this reason, its name Euxine, or hospitable, since the Greeks liked to propitiate adverse powers by giving them pleasant names. A mist of obscurity hangs about the beginnings of the first Greek cities, which arose on the Pontic shores. But the colonization beyond the Bosporus could not begin until the gate itself was secured. Colonists from Megara founded the settlement of Halcedon on the Asiatic side of the Bosporus in 685 BC. The site was so obviously inferior to that on the opposite shore that 17 years later, in 668 BC, they settled Byzantion, Latin Byzantium, on the European side of the Bosporus. The origins of Byzantium are shrouded in legend. The traditional legend has it that Byzas, son of King Nissus, planned to found a colony of the Dorian Greek city of Megara. Byzas consulted the oracle of Apollo at Delphi, which instructed Byzas to settle opposite the land of the blind. Leading a group of Megarian colonists, Byzas found a location where the Golden Horn, a great natural harbor, meets the Bosporus and flows into the Sea of Marmara opposite Halcedon. He judged the Halcedonians to be blind not to have recognized the advantages the land on the European side of the Bosporus had over the Asiatic side. The west side was considered far more fertile and better suited for agriculture. Thus he founded Byzantium at that location, fulfilling the oracle's requirement. While it lay in a highly fertile area, the city was far more important due to its strategic location. With its excellent harbor, Byzantium dominated the shipping up and down the Bosporus. Not only did it stand guard over the only entrance into the Black Sea, but it also lay by a deep inlet, the Golden Horn, meaning the city could only be attacked from the west. However, the great commercial and political importance of Byzantium would not fully be appreciated until a thousand years had passed, when it became the rival and successor of Rome and took in honor of its second founder, the name Constantinople. With the gates to the Bosporus now secure, Miletus seized the opportunity before anyone else could colonize the best sites on the Pontic shore. At that point, Lydia had become the dominant power in west-central Anatolia. Their king, Gyges, was currently warring with various Greek city-states on the coast and had brought the region of the Troad under his control. There'll be much more on him and the Lydians later in this episode. Anyway, Miletus approached Gyges and entered a formal alliance with the Lydians. In doing so, Gyges gave the Malaysians consent to establish colonies in the Troad. Thus, they established Abydos on the Asiatic side of the Hellespont in the northwestern coast of Asia Minor. Directly across from Abydos lay Sestos on the Thracian Chersonese, which is the modern Gallipoli Peninsula on the European side of Turkey. It was an Aeolian colony, as it was founded by settlers from Lesbos. Miletus also established a colony a little bit eastward jointly with Phocaea, called Lampsacus. And almost directly across the shore, Clazomenae joined Miletus in establishing Cardia on the Thracian Chersonese, essentially at the entrance to the Propontis. And a little bit more eastward, Miletus and Erythrae founded Perion. On the southern coast of the Propontis, at a jutting promontory where a narrow neck forms two harbors, Miletus established Kazikos. To the west of Byzantium, Megara also founded Selembria on the northern coast of the Propontis, which had a good port and controlled the land route into Thrace. With that, the Greeks had gained control of the Hellespont, Propontis, and Bosporus. Shortly thereafter, colonization of the Black Sea region began. It was not a Greek sea like the Aegean, but there were some colonies spotted all around the coastlines. It was an area rich in metals timber, grain, fish, and other products. But in addition, flax, iron, silver, and slaves were among the chief products that the Greeks coveted. At the most northerly point of the southern shore, a region known as Bithynia, a narrow-necked cape forms two natural harbors, making it an attractive site for settlers. And it was here that the Milesians established Sinope, planting their first flag for colonization in the Black Sea. It flourished as a trading port for a caravan route that led from the upper Euphrates Valley. Farther east, in the southeastern shoreline, arose another Milesian colony, named Trapezus. It sits in the Periadres, 
a mountain range parallel to the coastline and has almost no flat land that might have been suitable for agriculture. However, the city had a very important port and appears to have played a pivotal role in trade between Greece and the Iron Age civilizations of northeastern Anatolia, especially Arartu and the Masanoikoi, a tribal people in the mountains. Many metal artifacts must have been shipped to Greece from trapezes, which may explain why so many pieces of Greek art in the Oriental style resemble Arartian objects. In addition to producing much iron ore, the mountain slopes were covered with forests, allowing the trapezians to build ships and produce wine and honey. On the eastern coast of Thrace, which faces the Black Sea, there were several very important Greek colonies. Mesembria, in modern-day Bulgaria, was founded by Megara and was the only Dorian colony in the Black Sea. A little northward, Miletus founded Odessus. A little more northward, in modern-day Romania, Miletus then founded Istris, near the mouth of the Danube River, which is known as Ister in Greek. It was situated near fertile, arable land, but eventually fish became the main source of its revenue. More importantly, though, it facilitated trade with the native Getai, a Thracian tribe inhabiting the lower Danube. Attic amphorae have been found in great quantities there. The 6th century BC saw Greek settlements springing up in the more remote parts of the Black Sea, in Colchis and Scythia, by the Malaysians. Phasis was founded on the far eastern coast of the Black Sea in modern-day Georgia. Phasis was a mixed city in which the Greek settlers coexisted peacefully with the natives of Colchis. It was a vital component of the trade route from India to the Black Sea, according to Roman author Strabo and Pliny. A little bit northward sits Dioscorias. It is said to have been named for the Dioscori, the mythical twin brothers Castor and Pollux. It became important in the commerce between Greece and the indigenous tribes, importing pottery from many parts of Greece and exporting local salt and Caucasian timber, linen, and hemp. It was also a prime center of slave trade in Colchis. According to Strabo, the city and its surroundings were remarkable for the multitude of languages spoken there. Olbia was founded on the northwestern shore of the Black Sea in modern-day Ukraine. It was highly important commercially as it exported grain, fish, and slaves back to Greece and imported Attic goods in Assythia. Theodosia sits on the southern coast of the Crimean Peninsula that juts out into the center of the northern Black Sea. It flourished because of its rich agricultural lands. Panta Capaon sits on the far eastern end of the Crimean Peninsula on the western shore of the Sumerian Bosporus that leads into Lake Maotis. On the opposite shore sits Phanagoria on the Taman Peninsula in modern-day Russia. It was founded by colonists from Teos, who had to flee Asia Minor in consequence of their conflict with Cyrus the Great, the Persian king who we will come across in future episodes. These northern colonies thrived on trade with the Scythians. The Greeks of Asia Minor were largely dependent, for better or worse, on the adjacent inland countries. The inland trade added to their prosperity. The merchants of Miletus particularly prospered through trade with their various colonies, and since they sat at a strategic position on the southwestern coast of Anatolia, they became intermediaries between Anatolia and the Mediterranean. At the beginning of the 7th century BC, increasing contact was made between the Greeks and the kingdoms of Phrygia and Lydia of Anatolia. While hostilities occurred with the latter, it was an overall beneficial relationship with both. For instance, the Phrygians and Lydians both adapted a form of the Greek alphabet, while the Greeks adopted their modes of music and admitted many of their legends into the corpus of Greek mythology. Following the collapse of the Hittites, the Phrygians had crossed over the Hellespont from Thrace and eventually arose as the chief Iron Age kingdom, located in west-central Anatolia. They were ruled by several legendary kings. In the 9th century BC, Gordias was the supposed founder of their capital city of Gordium, which sits on the river Sangarius that flows from central Anatolia to the Black Sea. He was a farmer who was able to gain the throne. According to legend, when the Phrygians had suddenly found themselves without a king, they consulted an oracle and were told to elevate the first man to ride up to the temple in a cart. Well, it just so happens that the first man was Gordias. His ox cart was preserved and its yoke was secured with an intricate knot called the Gordian knot. A legend arose surrounding this knot 
saying that he who could unravel it would become master of all of Asia. Asia at that time was equated with Anatolia. His son Midas is arguably the most famous Phrygian king, remembered in Greek myth, for his ability to turn everything he touched into solid gold, from where we get the phrase, the Midas touch. He was also famous for a more unfortunate trait, his donkey ears, which he gained as punishment for judging Pan, the better musician than Apollo. Midas made offerings to Delphi, the first foreign monarch to do so. It is possible that the mythical figure of Midas was based on a real king of Phrygia known as Mitta in Assyrian records. In any event, trouble was brewing in the far north, where the Sumerians, who had inhabited the northern coast of the Black Sea, were being pushed southward by the Scythians. They traveled down the eastern coastline and soon enough found themselves at the doorstep of the Phrygian kingdom in the early 7th century BC. The Phrygians were overran, and Midas supposedly committed suicide by drinking bull's blood, so as not to be captured. A skeleton discovered in the tomb mounds outside Gordium has been tentatively attributed to Mitta by some scholars. Archaeology has also confirmed that Gordium was destroyed and burned around that time. As the Phrygians were overwhelmed by Sumerian invaders, the neighboring kingdom of Lydia to the west was growing in size and power. Lydia was founded by the legendary descendants of Heracles and was ruled by the Maonian dynasty, whose capital was at Sardis. On the next episode, we will discuss the rise of tyrannies in Greece during the 7th century BC, but the word tyrannos is not Greek. It probably was borrowed from Lydia, where we see the first instance of tyranny, or the gaining of a kingdom through unlawful means, when Gyges overthrew the last Maonian king, Candales, and established himself as king. According to Herodotus, Gyges had been the bodyguard of Candales. His queen was extremely beautiful, and Candales was very proud of that. In fact, he bragged about it often. Once, he even had Gyges hide behind a curtain to see his wife undressed, and thus the full extent of her beauty. As Gyges slipped away, he was spotted by the queen. She didn't say anything at that time, though. But the following day, she summons him to her quarters and tells him that he has disgraced her, and in order for him to make it right, he must kill the king and marry her, or he will be put to death himself. So he obviously chose the former, and that night he hides once again in the king's bedchambers, and when Candales is asleep, he slew him with a dagger. When news of this reached the other Lydians, a civil war was on the brink of exploding, until they all came to an agreement. If the oracle at Delphi declared Gyges as king, he would thus be hailed as the rightful king. Well, the oracle did in fact declare him the rightful king of Lydia, and thus Gyges became their king. The oracle also claimed that the Mermnan dynasty would be powerful, but due to his usurpation of the throne, it would fall in its fifth generation. This claim was later proven to be true, but there will be more on that later. It's likely that Gyges bribed the oracle for her blessing on the throne because afterwards, he sent an unbelievable amount of silver and gifts to Delphi. Gyges elevated the Lydian kingdom into a great military power almost overnight. He increased his country's size by claiming the other central Anatolian territories, once held by the Phrygians. The real source of his power was that the Lydians were incredibly wealthy. The magnificent capital of Sardis literally had a river of gold running through it, called the Pactolus which flows from Mount Timolus. It contains vast deposits of electrum, a natural occurring alloy of gold and silver. Legend has it that its metal source was King Midas of Phrygia, who had washed away his Midas touch in the waters of the Pactolus. For the Lydian kings, it was only a matter of extracting and refining the metal in order to fund their endeavors. In fact, this is what allowed Gyges to be able to send all those exuberant gifts to bribe the oracle at Delphi. Gyges set the Near Eastern precedent of the power controlling Central Asia Minor to try also to control the Greek coastal cities for tribute and access to the sea. He intended to bring all of Western Anatolia under his control, but the Ionian Greeks proved to be tougher to subdue than he had anticipated. One of his first targets was Smyrna, which was immediately to the west of Lydia and situated at the mouth of the Hermes River at the head of the Aegean Sea that reached far inland and allowed merchant ships to sail deep into Lydia. 
This placed it on a lucrative trade route between Anatolia and the Aegean, a distinction it shared with the nearby cities of Miletus and Ephesus. Gyges attacked the Smyrnaeans, but was routed on the banks of the Hermes River. This defeat must have been stinging, and Gyges turned his attention southward to Colophon, Ephesus, Miletus, and Magnesia. The Milesians and Ephesians were too strong, and thus he entered in alliances with them. However, Gyges was able to capture Colophon and Magnesia, and in the northeast, the Troad was brought under Lydian control. It was after these events that the Milesians began their colonizing movement to the northeast, as we discussed at the beginning of this episode. Gyges' most constant threat, though, was the Sumerians, who were still raiding in western Anatolia. So he sent requests for aid to the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal, who the Lydians had been allied with, and who at the time was occupied with war plans with the Medes and declined. There will be more on the Medes in future episodes. In any event, even without Assyrian help, Gyges managed to push the Sumerians out of western Anatolia. Then, out of spite, Gyges sent two prisoners of war to Nineveh, the Assyrian capital, and opened up relations with the new Egyptian pharaoh, Samtik. Samatikos in Greek, who had reunified a newly independent Egypt after throwing off the Assyrian yoke, offering to send him a large number of Ionian Greek and Carian mercenaries to help him consolidate his hold over the Nile Delta. Gyges met his end in another battle against the Sumerians, but the Lydian state he solidified would endure for the next century as it became more integrated into the larger Near East. The Sumerians took the capital of Sardis, except for the citadel, and it was not long before they swooped down upon the Greek cities. The Ephesians defied their attack, but the temple of Artemis, outside the walls, was burned down. The Sumerians also destroyed Magnesia. The danger soon passed, though, as Artis succeeded his father to the Lydian throne and was able to drive out the Sumerians from the land and succeeded in extending his power into Cappadocia. As far as the river Halys, Artis, who ruled from around 645 to 625 BC, was more pliant to Assyria than his father. He spent much of his reign warring against the Milesians with no success, and Priene, which he was able to capture. Regardless of certain Polace's hostilities towards Lydia, the expulsion of the Sumerians was just as much of a profound importance to the Greeks as the Lydians for the Greek cities depended largely on the Lydian kingdom for their prosperity. Sardis provided a market and an incentive for Greek craftsmanship, and the Lydian kings protected and encouraged the trade that came along the great caravan routes across Asia Minor. If the Sumerians established themselves permanently, Western Asia Minor could have very well relapsed into a new Dark Age. Fortunately, the invasion was only a passing whirlwind, doing much temporary damage but little permanent harm. Artis's son, Sadiates, who ruled from around 625 to 610 BC, continued to war with Miletus and once again led Lydia to attack Smyrna. This time, though, the city was taken and sacked. Although it was not destroyed, its Greek-Polish structure was reorganized into a village system, and its unique culture quickly faded, as its inhabitants were forced to move into the countryside. He invaded Clazomenae, but suffered a great defeat. He annually invaded Miletus in a unique way. Whenever the crops in its countryside had ripened, he would lead his army westward and plunder the fields, but his troops left the horses and houses untouched so that the Milesians could plant a new crop, which the Lydians would then pillage the following year. He did this because the Milesians had control of the sea so that a siege by his army would have done nothing. During his annual campaigns, he inflicted two serious defeats on the Milesians in battle. Only the Kiotes tried to help the Milesians, who did so because the Milesians had previously helped them against the Erythraeans during the Lelantine War. Sadiati's son, Aliates, who ruled from around 610 to 560 BC, continued his father's policies against Miletus. It was only through the inspired leadership of their tyrant, Thrasybulus, that Miletus was able to preserve its independence in the face of constant Lydian aggression, a result that Herodotus credits to Thrasybulus' tricking of Aliates into making peace. In the twelfth year of the war, when the crops were being burned by the army, 
The fire was driven by the wind against the temple of Athena, and the temple was burned to the ground. When the army came back to Sardis, Aliates fell sick. When the sickness persisted for quite a long time, he consulted the oracle at Delphi, but the Pythia denied him an oracle until he rebuilt the temple that he had burned. Somehow, Periander, tyrant of Corinth, found out about the oracle's reply to Aliates and sent a messenger to disclose this information to his closest Exenos, who happened to be Thrasybulus. After he received this news, he gathered up all the food left in Miletus and brought it into the public square. Then he told the Milesians to watch for his signal, at which point they would drink and be merry. Meanwhile, Aliates had sent a messenger to Miletus to call a truce for as long as they rebuild the temple. Thrasybulus, surmising that this would be Aliates' plan, because he was in a desperate situation, timed it so that the messengers would see the Milesians feasting when they arrived. Aliates had hoped that the people were close to a breaking point and running out of food after being sieged for 12 years. But when his herald arrived, telling him what they saw as the exact opposite, he made the decision that the war with Miletus was pointless, and in this manner he was tricked into peace with Miletus. The Lydians thus rebuilt the temple, and Aliates was relieved of his sickness. Afterwards, he too sent dedications to Delphi. Meanwhile, the Medes were becoming a powerful kingdom in northern Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau. Following the destruction of the Assyrian Empire, there will be more on the Medes in future episodes. But for now, we need to discuss a critical event that took place in the early 6th century BC. Although the Assyrian Empire and the kingdom of Urartu, modern-day Armenia, which had recently just fallen into the hands of the Median king Cyaxerxes, served as a de facto buffer state between the Anatolians and those from the Zagros Mountains. With those two destroyed, there no longer was anything preventing the Medes from seeking fresh conquest westward. Taking his own armies east to meet them, Aliates fought a first battle against Cyaxerxes around 590 BC. Five years of constant warfare followed, with neither side able to strike a decisive blow. Finally, on May 28th, 585 BC, they fought a major battle along the river Halys. Evenly matched as before, the battle stayed a relative draw until the sky suddenly became darkened by a total eclipse of the sun, which had been predicted by the famous first Greek philosopher, Thales of Miletus, ending the battle. The proposed solution of establishing the river Halys as their common frontier was met with agreement from both sides. In addition, Syaxeri's son, Astyages, was married to Arianus, the daughter of Aliates, and became king of the Medes when his father died shortly after the battle took place. Astyages' sister, Amitis, was currently serving as the queen of Nebuchadnezzar II in Babylon. Thus, for the first time in history, a single extended family ruled over all of Mesopotamia and Anatolia. The most revolutionary innovation of early 6th century BC was the invention of coinage. Kings, priests, soldiers, administrators, merchants, thieves, and so forth from Babylon, Phoenicia, and Egypt had all been using precious metals for thousands of years in the form of metal ingots, which would be cut out on the spot in standard sizes and shapes as a medium of exchange. But under the reign of the Lydian king Aliates, the concept of coinage developed in which lumps of a particular metal were stamped to denote a specified weight and purity that certified them to be of indefinite exchange value. The earliest Lydian coins, made of local electrum, were probably crafted as ceremonial objects, such as badges, and were issued by priests. Once Aliates decided to patronage the practice, coins were produced in large quantities. At first, coins received official marks that were little more than hammer blow impressions. But before long, engravers were used to mark the pieces of metal with emblems. Lydian coins were commonly stamped with images of a lion's head or sunbursts, the royal symbol of the Merbnad ruling dynasty. Even from the outset, there were attempts to gain the system. Naturally occurring gold in Anatolia typically had between 70 to 90 percent gold content, and the Lydians learned to alloy coins with redefined silver and copper bringing the actual gold content to around 50%. The core Lydian coin was known as a stator, or standard, and coins were minted from one value down to 196 stator value. 
Although all coins of equal weight were credited equally, once news of their different gold values came, Lydian coins were questioned by foreign merchants. It wasn't until the widespread use of pure silver coins in the 570s BC that the concept really became stable enough to catch on. Up until this time, wealth was defined by the grain one had in his barn, as Hesi had put it, essentially meaning land ownership. But thanks to their contact with the highly developed mercantile societies in the Near East, the Greeks were among the first to embrace the minting of coins, and thus wealth eventually became a bag of metals that could be traded in for something. As a monetary economy developed, the small shaped pieces of metal became more circular. The early adopters were from Ionia, Ephesus, Miletus, and Samos. From there it spread to mainland Greece and beyond. The island of Agina began to issue coins before 550 BC, and from there coinage spread to Athens, Corinth, and the Cyclotic Islands in the 540s BC, southern Italy and Sicily before 525 BC, and Thrace before 514 BC. The reasons for the rapid and widespread adoption of coinage by the Greeks are not entirely clear, and several possibilities, which are not mutually exclusive, have been suggested. One possibility is that coinage increased the ease of commerce. These coins all featured different symbols, weights, and denominations, but were all made of pure silver. Thus, it was not necessary for users of coinage to spend time determining whether the silver was pure. The fact that the coin had been issued by a community was a promise that it was worth a set value. Their value was the same everywhere and could be determined based on weight alone. Another possibility is that coinage was adopted specifically to enable communities to make payments to their citizens, mercenaries, and artisans in a transparent, fair, and efficient way. Similarly, when wealthy members of the community were required to contribute wealth to the community for festivals and the equipment of navies, coinage made the process more efficient and transparent. Regardless, the rapid and widespread adoption of coinage shows just how much Mediterranean trade was booming in the 6th century BC. The Greeks had two prominent systems of weights and measures. The earliest and heaviest was the Agenetan standard. Their silver stator, called didrachum, has been found regularly in Egypt and the Levant, places which were deficient in silver supply. In the same vein, other Greek cities in the Peloponnese and in northern Greece began to mint coins to this Agenetan standard. From Corinth, it spread to Corsaira and to their colonies of southern Italy. The lighter Euboean standard was adopted by Ionia and Athens. The Euboean standard would also be known as the Attic standard and was based on the Athenian drachma, which literally means a grasp or a handful. Drachmae were divided into six obols, from the Greek word for spit and six spits made a handful. This suggests that before coinage came to be used in Greece, spits were used as measures in daily transactions. In archaic pre-numismatic times, iron was valued for making durable tools and weapons, and its casting in spit form may have actually represented a form of transportable metal, which eventually became bulky and inconvenient after the adoption of precious metals. Because of this very aspect, Spartan legislation famously forbade issuance of Spartan coin and enforced the continued use of iron spits so as to discourage avarice and the hoarding of wealth. There will be more on this when we get to Sparta. Coinage also served to further unify the Greek world while permitting each polis individual expression. Most of these coinages were mostly only used within the community that issued them, but the turtles of Agina and the Owls of Athens were issued in great quantity and exported throughout the Greek world. At first, only one side of the coin, the obverse, was decorated. But before long, the other side, the reverse, too received distinguishing marks. The principal device on each side is often accompanied by accessory symbols or inscriptions, each with its own meaning. It was highly characteristic of the Greeks that their coinage from the beginning was secular in character as it was the work of merchants and magistrates, not of priests. And so the types of Greek coins are rarely religious. Some states chose their civic badge, such as the Bee of Ephesus and the Lion's Scalp of Samos. Others made good propaganda by illustrating their exports, such as the tuna fish of Cyzicus. Still others were called local legends, such as the Pegasus of Corinth or the Labyrinth of Knossos. 
In Athens, when the nobles were struggling to keep power, the coins often represented the ancestral symbols of the competing noble families. Coins offered an attractive field for the artist, and nowhere was the opportunity more richly exploited than in the western colonies. This universality of coinage exchange could also be viewed as aligning with the contemporary trends in Greek philosophy, or the search for a universal substance for which all things could be related. There will be more on that in a few episodes. From 560 to 546 BC, Croesus, the last and most famous Lydian king, succeeded his father, Aliates, to the throne. His sister Arianus was married to Astyages of Media, doing her part to maintain the balance between the Near Eastern empires. This reinforced the illusion of regional stability during the early years of his reign. Croesus wanted to expand his holdings in Anatolia, but he was left with limited options, with the Greeks in the west, the Medes in the northeast, and Babylon ruling over Cilicia in the southeast. His only remaining target was Caria in the southwest, ruled by indigenous Anatolian peoples, and was heavily influenced by the Greeks. So he led an army against them, subdued them, and claimed their territory. Next, he decided to test Ionian strength by launching an attack on Ephesus. After a brief conflict, the city was taken and occupied. With Ephesus under his control, and Smyrna having been captured by his grandfather, Croesus felt secure in Lydia's access to the Mediterranean, and left the remaining Greek cities alone. Herodotus relates an interesting anecdote, which is probably not true. In any event, at one point, Croesus decided he wanted to build ships and try to subdue all of the Greeks on the islands, but he was persuaded not to by either Bias of Priene or Pittacos of Mytilene. Herodotus says that his sources couldn't agree on which. Regardless, they were both one of the seven proverbial wise men of antiquity. In any event, whoever he was, told Croesus that the islanders were buying 10,000 horses to attack him at Sardis. Croesus was delighted to hear this because the Lydians were famous for their horse riding, and the Greeks lacked the skill and experience. But the other man then pointed out that wouldn't the islanders be just as excited to see Croesus attack them in ships when he had no experience on the sea himself? Croesus thought this advice was shrewd, and thus he was persuaded not to attack the Ionians on the islands. Croesus watched Lydia become even more prosperous under his rule. In service to the king, Lydian metallurgists had discovered the secret of separating gold from silver, allowing them to produce metals of purity that had never been seen before. Although he was incredibly wealthy before, it was ridiculous now. With money being of no object, Croesus funded the reconstruction of the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, now under Lydian occupation, turning it into one of the seven wonders of antiquity. It was 120 meters long and built entirely of marble, with columns being decorated with intricate reliefs. It housed a new ebony cult statue of the goddess. Antipater of Sidon, who later developed the list of the seven ancient wonders, proclaimed that the mere sight of the Artemisium caused all other marbles to lose their brilliance by comparison. Croesus' rule over Ephesus reflected his conflicted relations with the larger Greek world. At Ephesus, he restored and beautified an important temple, but also reorganized several settlements in defiance of the locals' wishes in order to enlarge the city proper. He believed in the oracle at Delphi, but only after he tested its powers. More on that in a future episode. He appreciated Greek culture, but also considered the Ionians as unwelcome visitors and remained alert for any opportunity to expel them from Anatolia altogether. The Greeks also had ambiguous feelings about him. On the one hand, they characterized him as a wealthy and powerful leader, who both understood and embraced Greek culture, serving as a civilized bastion against Eastern barbarianism. But at the same time, they had no illusions about letting Ionian defenses slacken. Ephesus made them painfully aware that there no longer was security and peace treaties. Meanwhile, the Greeks were also busy establishing relationships in Africa in the 7th century BC. As was mentioned before, Gyges sent Ionian and Carian mercenaries to the Egyptian pharaoh Samatikos in an effort to establish relations between the two kingdoms. Samatikos was trying to reunite Egypt and overthrow the Assyrian yoke. He offers them rewards in return for their aid in his campaigns. After consolidating his hold over the Nile Delta, The pharaoh, backed up by the military power of his new Ionian Greek and Carian mercenaries, 
drove the Assyrian garrisons out of Egypt. Tied down with internal struggles, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal couldn't prevent this from happening and Egypt once again was an independent state. Afterwards, the pharaoh made good on his word and bestowed on the mercenaries two parcels of land on either side of the Pelusian branch of the Nile. At present, these sites remain uncertain. For the rest of his reign, Samatikos developed close ties with the Hellenic world, even having an open invitation for Greeks to settle in Egypt and began to hire more and more Greek mercenaries to serve in the Egyptian army. Many Greeks flocked to Egypt, and this helped to relieve the pressure of overpopulation in Anatolia. Also, the Assyrians would never gain control over Egypt, and by the end of the century, internal problems and external enemies brought their empire to its conclusion. In order to foster greater trade between the Mediterranean Sea and the Indian Ocean, Samatikos' son, Neko, initiated a project to cut a navigable canal from a branch of the Nile through to the Red Sea, an early precursor to the Suez Canal. He also used a steady influx of Greek migrants to help him develop Egypt's first real deep-sea navy, an action long deterred due to the innate Egyptian fear of the ocean, and soon had warships operating along both the Mediterranean and Red Sea coasts. Around 600 BC, according to Herodotus, Necho sent out an expedition of Phoenicians who sailed from the Red Sea westwardly entirely around the coast of Africa, returning through the pillars of Heracles to the mouth of the Nile after a voyage of three years. If this is true, and there's a decent chance that it may be, they performed a feat that would not be repeated for over 2,000 years. About a decade later, Neko's son, Samatekos II, led his army on an expedition into Nubia. Along the way, a few of his Greek and Carian mercenaries left some famous graffiti of their names on the statue of Ramses II at Abu Simbel. Further west, along the African coastline in Libya, there was a very important colony at Cyrene, founded around 630 BC by Dorian settlers from the island of Thera, modern-day Santorini. Herodotus narrates this event in great detail, and thus it is our best literary evidence for how the colonies were founded. At one point, the king of Thera, a man named Grinis, traveled from the island to seek advice from the oracle of Apollo at Delphi on some matter that Herodotus does not give. But instead of answering him, the oracle tells him to found a new city in Libya. The problem was that neither the king nor the men who accompanied him knew where Libya was. So they went home and ignored the oracle's advice, which never leads to anything good. Well, as a consequence, no rain fell on Thera for seven years. Since Thera had no natural water supply of their own, being an island, they were utterly devastated by this drought, as the population was also increasing and could no longer support its residents. Apparently, the king didn't put two and two together until seven years later, when he consulted the oracle again, and she again told him to colonize Libya. Thus, he took her advice this time and sent messengers to Crete in search of someone who may know how to get to Libya. There, they came across a fisherman named Corobius, and they hired him to guide them to Libya. They landed on Plataea, an island off the Libyan coast, where they left Corobius while they went back to Thera to report that they had found Libya. They had left Corobius with enough provisions to last a few months, but the Therans never showed up and his supplies began to run out. Luckily, at this point, a Samian man named Calais shows up to the island and converses with Corobius. He gives Corobius fresh supplies and then sails off. If you recall from last episode, he is the supposed first Greek to reach Spain. It was after he left this island that those events transpire, when an easterly wind drove him all the way west to Spain when he was on his way to Egypt. In any event, the Thoraeans resolved to send one out of every two brothers to be chosen by lot, and from all districts under the leadership of a man named Aristoteles. They sailed off on two pentaconters. Herodotus reports that the Cyrenaeans told him that when the two ships had reached Libya, they tried to establish a settlement, weren't successful, and tried to go back to Thera, but the Thoraeans refused to allow them back and threw things at them from the shore. So the two ships turned around and headed back to Libya, and this time they were successful. This variance in their story is Cyrene's way of keeping their connection with Thera but also keeping them at a distance. In any event, 
Aristoteles and his followers arrived on the mainland and established Cyrene at a site about eight miles from the sea, on two hills that commanded a fertile plain near an abundant spring of water. They had learned their lesson with the drought on Thera. He made all the citizens swear an oath that they must stick it out and were not allowed to return to Thera. There is an inscription on Cyrene from the 4th century BC that claims to contain the original oath. Aristoteles then changed his name to Battus, which means king in the Libyan language. Its resemblance to the Greek word for stammer gave rise to the legend that he stammered in his speech. In any event, Battus was the first king of Cyrene and the founder of the Battii dynasty, whose eight kings would rule Cyrene from 630 to 440 BC. Battus died around 600 BC and was worshipped as a heroic figure by his subjects. He was succeeded by his son, Arcesilus, who ruled from 600 to 583 BC. Herodotus doesn't relate any events occurring during his reign. But under his son and the third king of the dynasty, Battus II, who ruled from 583 to 560 BC, the city was reinforced by a large incoming of new settlers from the Peloponnese, Crete, and other Aegean islands at the behest of the oracle at Delphi, who decreed, He who comes to beloved Libya too late for the division of land will be sorry some day. This expansion of the city worried some of their Libyan neighbors, and thus the Libyan king, a man named Atacran, dispatched an embassy to seek an alliance with the Egyptian pharaoh Apris, the son of Samaticus II. It's unclear why the pharaoh would take up arms against other Greeks, knowing that Greek mercenaries made up the core of his own army. Apris was at least smart enough, though, to dispatch a native Egyptian force to confront the Cyrenians because it's highly unlikely that the Greeks would have fought other Greeks for non-Greeks at this point. On the other hand, there was a reason that Greeks were highly esteemed as warriors. Around 570 BC, the Egyptians and the Cyrenians clashed in the first battle ever fought between the Greeks and the Egyptians. Apris's native Egyptian force was easily outmatched by the Greeks and suffered a humiliating defeat in which very few Egyptians survived. For the Egyptian army, this was one military disaster too many. During his rule, a priest had suffered another humiliating defeat to the Babylonians when they tried to assist the Hebrews during the siege of Jerusalem in 587-586 BC. Conspiracy theories began to abound that maybe the Pharaoh had wanted them to be defeated in order to diminish the army's reputation and standing in Egypt, or that he might use the defeat to push for a takeover of the army by his Greek allies. In fairly short order, Egyptian forces were on the march back towards Sais, the current capital of Egypt in the Nile Delta, with the regime change foremost on their minds. Hearing the news, a priest sent a respected Egyptian general to meet with the rebels to defuse the situation. This would have worked, more than likely, except the general ended up switching sides and was quickly proclaimed the pharaoh Amause II, or Massus in Greek. After a bloody civil war that saw the death of a priest, Amasis immediately focused his attention on the main issue that had brought him to power. Ever since the rule of Samatikos, Greek migrants had flowed into Egypt in ever greater numbers. In many ways, including trade, culture, and military skill, their presence had been a great boon to Egyptian society. However, the inherent problems of integrating the outward-looking Greeks into the conservative culture of their new home had never been adequately addressed. A balance needed to be struck in which Egypt could continue to prosper from the Greek presence without allowing them to threaten the fundamental tenets of Egyptian society. The decision Amasis came to was centralization. In the time of Samatikos, Greek mercenaries had been settled into two military camps on either side of the Pelusium branch of the Nile. In the aftermath of the Civil War, Amasis closed these camps and relocated all Greek mercenaries to the old capital at Memphis, where he could more closely monitor their activities. Next, a solution was needed for the scattered Greek migrants currently residing in various cities and villages across the country. Amasis selected a spot along the Canopic branch of the Nile and handed it over to all Greek citizens of Egypt for their settlement. It became known as Nocritus, whose root word naos means ship. It was at once a generous gesture and calculated move to concentrate all Greek activities in one place, under the pharaoh's control. Nocritus was an unqualified success. Operating under the special trading rights and privileges granted by Amasis, Nocritus soon became a major seaport and commercial link between Egypt and Greece, 
an emporion similar to the role that Almina held between Greece and the Near East. Over the next few centuries, the city would grow to become Egypt's most important commercial harbor, only losing this distinction to the later Hellenistic capital of Alexandria. Its centerpiece was a great temple precinct, called the Hellenion, financed by Greek merchants from nine different poles. The Ionian cities of Chios, Tios, Phocaea, and Clazomenae, the Dorian cities of Rhodes, Canidos, Halicarnassus, and Phasilus, and the Aeolian city of Mytilene. Citizens from Miletus to Apollo, Samos to Hera, and Agina to Zeus maintained their own separate sanctuaries. According to Herodotus, natives of dozens of Greek cities live side by side there, a novelty in archaic Greek society. The Egyptians welcomed the Greeks' in military skill, and they imported tin, silver, timber, olive oil, and wine, while they supplied the Greeks with grain, linen, and papyrus. In terms of culture, Amasis strove to keep the exchange flowing in one direction, encouraging the export of Egyptian architectural and sculptural techniques back to Greece, while ensuring that new developments in Greek art and philosophy remained securely bound within the walls of Nocritus. Regardless of his authenticity, which we will cover in a future episode, Herodotus is my favorite Greek historian, simply for his anecdotal stories. In this particular one, he says that the prostitutes of Nocritus were peculiarly alluring and specially endowed by Aphrodite, and relates the story of Rhodopus. She was a beautiful Thracian slave and courtesan to Xanthus of Samos, who also owned the legendary fable teller Aesop. At one point, he took her along with him to Nocritus, during the reign of Amasis, where she met Caruxus, brother of the poet Sappho. More on her and Aesop in a future episode. Caruxus fell in love with her and purchased her freedom for what Herodotus describes as a vast sum. But she didn't love him, and he returned home to Mytilene, brokenhearted. Sappho later wrote a poem, denouncing and mocking her harshly, accusing Rhodopus of robbing Caruxus of his property. Because after attaining her freedom, she set up a house of ill repute, built up a thriving business, and amassed a small fortune. As a measure of thanks, she commissioned expensive votive offerings to Delphi. Another tale about Rhodopus was related by Strabo. He writes that as Rhodopus was one day bathing at Nocritus, an eagle took up one of her sandals, flew away with it, and dropped it in the lap of the Egyptian pharaoh while he was in the middle of administrating justice at Memphis. Struck by the strange occurrence and the beauty of the sandal, he did not rest till he had found the fair owner of the beautiful sandal. And as soon as he had discovered her, he made her his queen. This is essentially the earliest Cinderella story, except in this case, Cinderella was a former courtesan who ran a prostitution ring and had a small fortune. But we will let that slide. The victory against the Egyptians had confirmed the sovereignty of Cyrene, leading to Battus and Amasis to make an alliance. His son, Arcesilus II, ruled from 560 to 550 BC. He was the fourth king of the Battia dynasty, and it was from his reign onward that the dynasty began to fall into decline. Arcesilus II had an ill-mannered and vicious nature, for which Plutarch gave him the surname, the Oppressor. He was said to have ordered the banishment and deaths of various nobles whom he did not like. But it's from his reign that we find a very unusual piece of work in Greece face painting. The so-called Arcesilus Cup depicts a king seated under a tent-like sheet, watching men packing, weighing, and stacking trade goods, possibly silphium or wool. Added inscriptions specify their activities and the king's name. This is very unusual in Greek vase painting as depictions of living political figures, is extremely rare. Cyrene became a wealthy town, not only in its exportation of wheat, barley, and olive oil, but most importantly, through its monopoly in the export of silphium, a plant which acquired a high reputation for medicinal virtues and was richly prized throughout the Greek world. There was also excellent farmland, and the men of Cyrene became famous for rearing horses and for skill as riders and charioteers. They were also big sheep herders and exporters of wool. Arcesilus II had as an advisor a man called Learchus. Herodotus states that Learchus was his brother. However, Plutarch states that Learchus was just a friend. In any event, 
When Arcesilus II found out that his brother friend, Learchus, was secretly plotting behind his back to become Cyrene's new king, Arcesilus II ordered Learchus and his other brothers, or Learchus' supporters, to be exiled from Cyrene. But Learchus was able to persuade the local Libyan tribes, who were already disgruntled at having been cut off from a large part of their lands, to withdraw their allegiance from Cyrene and join them to declare war on Arcesilus II. In the battle that followed, the Libyans won a great victory over Arcesilus II and the Cyrenians, in which Herodotus reports that 7,000 hoplites were slain. Following this calamity, Arcesilus II became very ill after consuming a poisonous drink containing a deadly fish called a sea hare. As reported by Plutarch, it was given to him on the orders of Learchus, who apparently had increased support in the camp of Arcesilus II after the battle. But the poison only weakened him, and thus Learchus slipped into the Cyrenean camp and then strangled him to death. Learchus returned to Cyrene and attempted to make himself the new king. Ariexo, the now widowed wife of Arcesilus II, pretended to be thankful for what Learchus had done, and even agreed to marry him. When she invited him into her bedroom, before the ceremony, several men stepped out from behind her curtains and ran their swords through his body, killing him. His body was then thrown over the wall, and Ariaxo proclaimed her son, Battus II, to be the rightful king of Cyrene. We are going to leave Lydia, Egypt, and Cyrene there for now. They will eventually attract the attention of the Persians, the new power in the Near East that was developing in the 6th century BC. And that is where our story will pick up in a future episode. But for now, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves, and we must shift our attention back to mainland Greece now that all of this colonization was mostly complete by the mid-6th century BC. The Greeks were in places that they had never been before. They soaked up all that they could from the ancient civilizations in the Near East, while they themselves heavily impacted the uncivilized West and the Northeast. The Greeks now had access to different food supplies and raw materials. Colonization had begun as an answer to land hunger and political unrest. It did something to reduce the first of these problems but paradoxically, it actually increased the second. This was because the growth of Greek cities overseas led to an increase in trade. Since the old noble families did not engage in trade as their wealth was on the land, a new middle class emerged of people whose wealth came from industry and commerce. As their wealth grew, so did their wish to share political power. The nobility would refuse and try to hold on for as long as they could, but ultimately this led to a new political phenomena arising in various parts of the Greek world in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 16, The Rise of Tyranny. If you haven't done so yet, please head on over to iTunes and rate and review the show. It would help the podcast grow immensely. Also, while you're there, subscribe to the show so it comes onto your phone every week. If you don't have iTunes, you can catch the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play. Also, make sure you are checking out the website at thehistoryofancientgreece.com, where I've posted a lot of neat supplementary photos, maps, and charts for each episode. Thanks everyone for your continued support, and I hope you are enjoying the podcast. I would like to give a special thanks to the amazing artist Michael Levy for allowing me to feature his music on this podcast. He transports you to the ancient world, bringing to life the melodies and using the techniques of the past. A new song will be played every episode. This one is titled, Hymn to the Muse, from his album, The Ancient Greek Liar. If you like what you heard and are curious to learn more about ancient Greek music, check out his website at ancientliar.com. His albums are available in every major digital music store, including iTunes, Amazon, and Spotify.